it's never too late. It's never too late to start, whether it's eating healthy, whether it's exercising, it's never too late. So don't throw your hands up and say, ah, I'm 70, I've never done anything, it's too late. It is not too late. So start today and don't wait till Monday or January 2nd. That's what everybody says. Well, it's the weekend, I'll wait till Monday to start. No, start right now, start at your next meal and try to improve what you're eating. Hey y'all, it's Costa. Today I'm here with my guest, Dr. Christine Rosenblum registered dietitian nutritionist, licensed dietitian, and co-author of Food and Fitness After 50. Dr. Rosenblum is a regular contributor to AARP, WebMD, and countless other publishing resources while becoming a trusted nutritional consultant for brands like General Mills, the Grains Food Foundation, and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Dr. Rosenblum, at the most basic level, how are our nutritional needs changing as we age? I look at it as a quality and a quantity issue. So as we age, we need fewer calories. So we need to eat less calories, less energy, but we need some more of some nutrients. So we have to be more careful about the quality of the foods that we choose and looking at what we call the nutrient density or the nutrient intensity of food. So we need the nutrients, but we don't need as many calories. I think that's a problem for a lot of people. I see a lot of people talk about this weight creep. You know, oh, I'm 20 pounds heavier now that I'm 70 than I was when I was 50, but you didn't gain it overnight. It's a pound or two a year. Do you think most people are properly educated or prepared for how their nutritional and fitness needs will change as they age? And what's the biggest misunderstanding? Uh, I think a lot of people have education about it, but it's not always easy to put it into practice. So they may have the right knowledge or they may have the right attitude, but their behaviors don't match. So what I think is the biggest misunderstanding is that there's one magic bullet, be it a superfood or a toxic food, uh, one food, one diet that you should always eat or never eat. And that's the number one question I'm asked. What's the best food for me to eat? What's the worst food for me to eat? What's the best diet for me to be on? What's the best exercise? So everybody just wants the best, but they don't think about the big picture. And the big picture is a lot more important than any single thing. Is it is it a circumstance of consistency though? So like for example, you know, um, whether it's you know exercise, for example, you know, if you're mm -hmm. consistent in exercise, you don't necessarily have to go out and you know run. 10 miles or exercise for four or five hours. But if you, you know, maybe say 30 minutes a day um, or a mile a day, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of get that level of consistency and then your body starts to adapt. Does food work the same way? Like if you consistently eat the right foods, you'll feel better. But then again, what does a consistent diet kind of look like? Yeah, I, that's a good question. And, and I think it's different for everybody. Um, what we try to tell people is to just make, you know, make little changes in your diet so that it can be consistent. I think the biggest mistake people make is um, I'm going to overhaul my whole diet today. I'm going to go and throw everything out of my refrigerator and pantry and start over. And for a diet pattern to be helpful, it has to be sustainable. You know, we talk about sustainability a lot with agriculture, but it also has to be sustainable for your lifestyle. So if you hate beans and I tell you, you should be on a bean diet, yeah, it's not going to work. So I think the consistency is important with what you eat, but I think it's more important to look at your whole dietary pattern so that you don't have to deprive yourself. I mean, I saw a woman the other day who said she wasn't going to eat any cake at her grandson's birthday party. That's sad. <laughs> That's sad right? to me. No kidding. <laughs> There's no reason that you have to be that rigid with yourself. And I think that's one of the things I see some people is they're just so ingrained in that I can't eat anything that's bad for me. And then they equate their self as being bad. And food's not a moral issue. You're not a good or bad person um, if you ate something you don't think you should. Right. But as people get older, does the... Um does eating things like fried foods, does it affect their body somewhat differently in terms of how they digest the food? And also, does it have any kind of negative health outcomes? Or if you've always eaten, say, for example, a diet that consists of chicken fingers or other fried food, just because you get older doesn't mean that you have to be as cognizant of changing your diet. 
you know, unless you chose your parents really carefully, I think it's important for you to really think about your diet as you get older. And the reason that nutritionists often say to limit fried foods is it can triple the calories. So, and fried foods are harder to digest. Now, some people have a GI system that they can digest anything and never have any problems, but others, you know, really struggle with it. So I'd say, you know, fried foods should be limited. I wouldn't recommend people eating a lot of fried foods. I, like a lot of people, went out and got an air fryer during the pandemic. <laughs> it was a great purchase because you get that taste of a food that's fried, but it's a lot healthier. So I think that, you know, frying foods, it, for me, it's the tripling of the calories. And then for some people, it is a little bit harder to digest. Quite a bit of your writing and advocacy converges at the intersection of food and fitness. How does the synergy of these two impact the aging process? Well, it's really important. If you're going to be active, you still have to feed that activity. Um, and I think the best example probably comes with our muscle mass. You know, we can start to lose muscle mass in our mid-40s. And by the time we're in our older ages, we can lose up to 50% of our muscle mass if we're not being physically active. And the good news is that can be reversed. It's pretty easy to reverse it. So I think if, if we're trying to work on building muscle mass with whatever way you do that, um, if you're not feeding it properly, then you're not going to get the gains. And the same thing with the diet. If you're working out a lot, but you're not seeing results in terms of losing fat mass or anything, it, then you want to look to your diet. So the two work hand in hand. And when people say, again, what's the best? Should I just exercise or should I eat better? You know, there is no best. You really need to do a little bit of both. doesn't have to be perfect by whatever your standards of perfect are, but you do have to think about both being important. When you describe diet and exercise to people um, that are older individuals, mm -hmm. Um, over the age of 65, do you give them somewhat of a, of a range or kind of like a benchmark, like, you know, work out this much or this often, do these types of exercises, or do you say like, maybe try to get your heart rate up to this number? Um, yeah. and then when it comes to the food, are there specific foods that you say, you know, you should probably consider eating at least if you don't eat anything else or take any of my advice, at least try and eat this. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on where the person is. You know, if you have somebody who's been very sedentary, we just want them to move more. Sure. Uh, we just want them to get up and move more. And I think, you know, things like our little fitness watches that tell us, you know, we've been inactive for a while. I think those can help. Um, but if it's somebody who is very physically active and they're really trying to, let's say, get prepared for some kind of competition, they're going to be in a senior Olympic event, it would be very different for, for that kind of advice. But I think for the most of the people that I talk to, uh, it's just that ability to move more. And, and I'll tell you one of the things that I've seen recently that's interesting is some researchers have coined the term active couch potatoes. The people that will exercise for one hour a day, but then they sit the rest of the day. So we really want to try to, to break that up a little bit. Yes, going out and exercising at the Y or wherever for an hour is great, but if you're going to sit the rest of the day, you might negate that. So trying to be as active as you can. Another That's thing fascinating. I really like, yeah, I, and I like to tell people, you know, when they ask about exercise and what they should do, I like to add, turn it back on them and say, well, what do you like to do? So let's think in our older age about what we call functional fitness. Um, you know, for me... I have a big, strong dog, and I want to be able to walk that dog without him pulling my arm out of the socket, you know, so I need some upper body strength, and I need to also be careful about my agility and balance and coordination so I don't fall. So those are kind of drivers for me. I like to travel, so I want to be able to lift my own suitcase in the overhead bin. Uh, you know, so things like that, I'm not going to be in a, you know, Olympics uh, contest, right. but I want to be able to be as active as I can for as long as I can. Um, and I think that's the goal for many people. They just want to continue to do what they want to do, whether it's getting up, off the, up and off the floor after playing with their grandkids or gardening or working in their landscape. So I always say, what do you want to do? And then let's work on how we get there. Is it possible to live a long and healthy life with one or the other? Well, again, that goes back to the genetics. You know, if, 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 you, if you choose your parents carefully, you can. Um, <laughs> and I hear people say that all the time. Well, my grandfather lived to be 93 and he didn't exercise and he smoked. And I say, well, good for him. You know? Right, <laughs> exactly. I you know, wish we all so had many, that luxury. Yeah, there's so many things. Just, even, but even if you don't have good genetics, our Modern medicine today, along with a good lifestyle, can help people live long, healthy lives. 
um, you know, even if you've had bypass surgery or you have hypertension, you know, 80% of people over 65 have at least one chronic disease. It doesn't mean they're an invalid. It means that they can manage that with right medical care and lifestyle. I think too often people want to jump to the medication and not think about what could I do with lifestyle. So I think they both work together. You know, you've been doing this for quite some time. Um, as you see how our industry has evolved, um, healthcare industry for that matter, um, has evolved. And you mentioned medication being sort of the catch all for, for mm -hmm. every single solution. How frustrating it is it for you being a dietitian and seeing and, and a nutritionist and seeing the, um, or specializing in these fields and mm -hmm. seeing the the outcomes that a healthy diet and a lifestyle of exercise has versus the medication. And do you ever feel like you're kind of like banging your head against the wall, hoping that somebody <laughs> kind of gets wakes yeah. up and listens? Yeah, every day. And and I think it starts with um, the, the healthcare industry. I think it starts with physicians. I mean, so many yeah. physicians are so time squeezed and they don't have much education in nutrition that they'll say to somebody, yeah, eat better, exercise more. But, you know, that's the little, you know, forward advice is of patients going out the door with a script in their hand. So they don't really focus on that. And, and I think it gets into our healthcare system where we don't really focus on prevention. We're really good at acute care and we're, we're good at fixing things when they're broken, but we're not very good at the prevention, preventative care. And I would love to see us do that more starting at younger ages so that it's ingrained into folks, into their lifestyle. You know, just learning how to cook. You know? I think that you know, culinary medicine is something that, you know, there are some people that are doing that. I think that's fascinating that, you know, people who cook tend to have a healthier lifestyle than those that don't know how to cook. Well, and. So the the phenomenon of people not knowing how to cook is uh, somewhat new, I, I believe, um, and fascinating, by the way, <laughs> that somehow we managed to lose a generation of people in terms of teaching them how to cook. Uh, yeah. That's always, always uh, strikes me as odd. Uh, yeah, but one of the one of the things that that I always come back to, and so the individuals that that we provide care for, um, a lot of times they're they're their dietary habits are questionable. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes, you know, I have times that I talk to them and ask them like, you know, well, um, you know, kind of where did you pick up this habit of eating, you know, fast food for that matter. Mm -hmm. And some of them have said, and I, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, um, that, you know, this is what they've been eating their entire life going back to kindergarten. And so, What's your thoughts on kind of what we do in terms of our school lunches and we've kind of conditioned people, um, conditioned kids who end up growing up to be adults and then end up aging mm -hmm. um, to eat, you know, pizza and burgers and, mm -hmm. and, chick and, and chicken nuggets and, yeah. you know, French fries and stuff like that? Yeah, it's, it is frustrating. And I think it's not just the school programs. It's what people do at home. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I have about 45 or six nieces, nephews, great nieces and nephews. And I see the parents just give in because it's more difficult to sit down to a family meal and encourage right. the children to try things. I don't think you have to force them to eat anything, but that sitting down together and trying things instead is just easier to run the drive through and get chicken nuggets because the kid's going to pitch a fit otherwise. <laughs> is, but is that dynamic similar to people that are, that are also elderly, you know, and they may, you know, they may never, and this is going to sound strange, but I've encountered this. They may never have, they may never have eaten vegetables other than maybe a potato. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, trying to, um, introduce something like that to somebody that's in their, 50s or 60s or mm -hmm. 70s um, can be somewhat challenging. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I remember reading this uh, report a long time ago that said kids today, um, because they grew up in a school, maybe a school lunch program where they were eating instant mashed potatoes, when they were given real mashed potatoes, didn't like them because their taste was for the one that was a more ultra processed, more salty, right. higher in yep. fat than just a regular potato that's mashed. So I think we have a long way to go. I mean, I'd love to see schools go back to 
you know, home economics <laughs> where they're teaching yes. kids some of the basics about cooking. And not just the girls, but everybody would need those basic skills. Uh, I have a good friend who, when her son was graduated from high school, made him do what she called Mom 101. So for one a year, he had to plan a family meal once a week, do all the shopping, the cooking, and the cleanup. You know, so those little basic things, so they would have some skill set going off to college. But um, unfortunately, we, we, we seem to have lost a <laughs> whole generation when it comes yep. to cooking. Yeah. It's easier to call Uber Eats. <laughs> That's right. There are so many branded diets out there. Mediterranean, keto, vegan, etc. Are there any specific dietary patterns you believe to be especially beneficial for older adults? Yeah, I love that you said dietary patterns because it is the whole pattern. It's the whole meal. Um, some of the ones that we, we feature in our book that we like, and they have principles that we I think are important. One is that it contains all the energy nutrients. So that does have carbohydrate, protein, healthy fat. We're not big on don't eat any carbs or only go all fat or only all meat. So we think that balance is important. It's also important to choose those foods, as I mentioned earlier, that are more nutrient rich so that you're getting some of those nutrients that you need, like vitamin B12 and calcium and vitamin D, things that we need more of as we get older. Um, and then the other thing is that idea of risk for chronic disease. You know, we do have people do have hypertension and osteoporosis. And so what, what foods are going to help them? And then the fourth one is where I think a lot of people fall down is that it should be enjoyable. You should really enjoy the foods that you eat and the environment that you eat in. So based on that, the plans that we like to recommend are the Mediterranean diet. But I think a lot of people don't understand the Mediterranean diet. They think they'll go to a restaurant and eat. Um, five cheese meat lasagna and endless <laughs> salad bowl and breadsticks and boom, it's Mediterranean. Right. Um, right. No, it's not. And and a Mediterranean diet, it depends on what area you are in the Mediterranean. You know, it's very different if you're in North Africa versus you're in Greece. So, um, but they do have some commonalities, which is that use of olive oil or uh, a lot of seafood because it is around the Mediterranean beans, nuts, greens. So those kinds of foods in there. So Mediterranean diet we like. We also like the DASH diet, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. That's a study diet that's been well studied that you can actually lower your blood pressure as much as some of the first generation medications on following wow. a dietary pattern. But again, a doctor would rather hand somebody a script for hypertension than try to tell them about the DASH diet. Um, we also like what we call a flex flexitarian diet. You know, I think a lot of older adults aren't going to go vegan. It, that's a little too foreign, but they might be more plant forward or plant based by going flexitarian, which, you know, you don't pick up your turkey on Thanksgiving. But, you know, most of the time you're eating more meatless meals, more beans and lentils and peas and things like that. I mean, they do have like tofurkey, you know, like the. Yeah, it's not good. The, uh, it's not okay. <laughs> I tried it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, we tried a um, a turkey roll. I think it was made more with flour gluten, and it looked kind of cool, and it had cranberries in the middle and nuts. It tasted awful. We ended up oh, no. food waste <laughs> not tossing half of it. So, you know, we try things, but they're not that great. <laughs> what are, you know, of the, of the three diets that you mentioned, what are some common dishes that people prepare for themselves so that some of the listeners um, can, you know, take that information and say, okay, well, you know what? You know, three times a week, I am going to prepare this dish or a version of this dish. Yeah. I would say, you know, anything that has a lot of vegetables in it. So okay. maybe like a vegetable, a pasta primavera. And that's one of the things that we love to do is just saute whatever vegetables are left over in the drawer. It could be peppers, it could be carrots, it could be broccoli. And saute that in a little olive oil and then serve that over a little bit of pasta. Again, a little olive oil and if you want some fresh Parmesan cheese. But that's a great meal. It's quick. It's easy. And it gives you those increased number of servings of vegetables. So those are always great things. I, to think about. I haven't eaten lunch yet, so okay, I'm all right. Hungry. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, make a big pot of lentil soup, a big pot of vegetable soup as the weather's getting cooler, and have those kinds of things. I think anything yeah. you can do to throw vegetables in, whether you're making an omelet for breakfast, think about what's in that veggie drawer that you could use up, because you can put just about anything. Uh, in an omelet. So any ways that you can increase vegetable and fruit consumption would be a plus. And this may sound like an ignorant question, but why do you believe that vegetables are so important to your diet? So many reasons. I mean, one is that they'll provide fiber and we're woefully short on our fiber intake. So it's one way to get fiber. 
Um, they also have not only just the vitamins and minerals, but what we call those phytonutrients, the, the, the chemicals that are in food um, that you can't distill down to a pill. So they have all kinds of antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory properties. So things that uh, come in vegetable packages like that are very beneficial. So by eating more vegetables, you're going to get all of those healthy nutrients. A lot of those nutrients that are in vegetables are there as a defense mechanism against pests. So we're kind of eating the vegetables to get some of their own defense mechanisms, which in turn help us stay healthy. It's fascinating. So one more follow-up question. What about if you're somebody that's on a fixed income mm. um, and you want to eat healthy, yeah. but you just can't afford to eat healthy? Well, you know, I hear that a lot. And I think it depends on what you, then your definition of healthy would be. I think it's not, it's not um, at all poor dietary choices to use frozen vegetables, which are a lot less expensive sometimes. Um, and actually, sometimes you have better food waste because you're not going to throw away that one lousy stock of broccoli that's left in the drawer. So, you know, look at uh, frozen vegetables. Um, look at private label brands um, in the grocery store. They're often the same quality, but yet the cost is lower. Um, mm. And then the other thing is cut out some of those foods that are expensive, that, you know, like chips and snack foods and um, cookies and candies. You know, those things are expensive, too. So think about shifting your budget to some of the foods that are less expensive but are more healthy. And then the last thing I'd say is try to eat in season. You know, anytime you're eating seasonal fruits or vegetables, you're going to have a better quality and also a lower price. So if you want to eat raspberries now, you're going to pay a lot more because they're going to probably be imported from someplace south of the border, maybe even South America or Central America, than you right. would get in the summer. How does nutrition impact cognitive functions and mental health as we age? And are there any foods or nutrients you recommend to support brain health? Health. Yeah, I think that's a growing area of research. Um, I can tell you that the groups like the Alzheimer's Association often say what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So okay. the same kind of things that we recommend for heart cardiovascular health, not smoking, keeping it a healthy way, exercising, you know, eating a low diet, low in saturated fats. Those are all beneficial for the brain as well. But the other thing, some specific nutrients, we think about omega-3 fatty acids. So those okay. kind of fish oils or the, the kind of fats we get in fish. So whether it's from tuna or salmon or um, some people don't like mackerel or herring, but those kind of fatty fish have a lot of the omega-3s. There's a lot of good research about omega-3s in brain health. So that's why some of the organizations like the Heart Association recommend that we eat at least two servings of fish each week. And we're not great at doing that, um, but that's where things like canned or pouched tuna can come in. You can use those pretty conveniently and yet still get the seafood serving. <clears throat> so I think that the, the seafood is one of those things. Um, mm -hmm. Another group of foods that they're looking at for brain health are berries, anything that's that dark color. So whether it's blueberries or raspberries or strawberries, or blackberries, um, those are part of a diet pattern that we've probably heard of called the MIND diet, which is that uh, Mediterranean intervention uh, for neurodegenerative delay. So it's easier to say MIND than all of those words. But that diet's rich in berries, it's rich in seafood, it's rich in dark green leafy vegetables. So those are some foods that I would definitely add to my diet or try to you know, make kind of the, the, the meals around those uh, for cognitive health. What do you think about some of the vitamins that, that they market nowadays, like Prevagen, and then just, you know, in general, like the omega-3 mm -hmm. fatty acid, yeah. the, the vitamins that there? I mean, can you take vitamins and supplements to achieve the same outcome as you would, you know, eating those berries and those dark leafy greens? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think when it comes to things like omega-3s, there's pretty good science. So if you don't eat fish or you hate fish and you're not going to eat it, then taking an omega-3 supplement. And I would really look for omega-3 supplement, not one that's already hidden in a multivitamin, because you're not going to get that much. Um, I think that can be beneficial. But um, also, when you think about seafood, you're going to get protein. So you're not going to get that in a supplement. So the supplement is a single supplement. And it's a supplement to your diet. It's never meant to be a replacement. And the problem I have with a lot of the things you mentioned for cognitive health, we're not very good at regulating supplement industry. It's, no, it's, we're it's not. It's a unique <laughs> place between food and drugs. 
And so any claims can be made. Um, I talk to people about this all the time. They say, well, it supports my bones. Well, that's not the same as preventing osteoporosis. You know, that's all they can say, that it supports bone health. It right. supports heart health. So there are so many wild claims out there for supplements that I think if you're going to, to look at it, you know, try to get more than just the advice from the people making the supplement. Sure. <laughs> Use the Office of Dietary Supplements database. They have a great free website on the NIH. Um, I go to that a lot to look up supplements and look up some of the things that uh, would be beneficial or not beneficial about taking the supplement. So safe to say that Prevagen and those other brain health supplements probably don't work the I way that they, they are marketed. Yeah, you know, um, there's been a lot of talk about supplements like Prevagen and how they kind of, uh, they say they have clinical studies, but they cut the data in a way. Um, you know, I was mm -hmm. in academia for a long time, and we always say if you torture the data long enough, they confess. So yes. um, <laughs> they did a lot of that, slicing the dicing of that. Um, but there are a few. There, there's one that's kind of interesting that, that's called, it's, it's, a, it's a type of choline called cytocholine. Um, and that's okay. got some, some sound research. They used it a lot in Japan for patients who had stroke, and it seemed to help with cognitive function. So there's a lot of research around some of those supplements. So I would look into it more deeply than just relying on what the manufacturer is telling you. As we age, maintaining muscle mass is vital. How important is protein intake and exercise in this equation? And are there specific guidelines for older adults? Yeah, um, the, maintaining your muscle mass is so important. And, and as I mentioned, that's one of the things we can lose our muscle mass. And we don't want to get into the point where we're sarcopenic, you know, literally That's banishing the one, yeah. flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we want to stay away from that. And you see that a lot in older people that aren't very active. Um, so maintaining muscle mass is really important. But then you have to feed that with protein. And we need more protein as we get older. And not only do we need more protein, but we need to have it throughout the day to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So we need about 25 to 30 grams of protein at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Most people get very little at breakfast, depending on what they eat, and then they backload it all and have it at the end of the day. So I had um, a friend here recently, and his breakfast was toast with honey. I was like, you need more protein. You're not eating <laughs> protein at breakfast. You know, it could be Greek yogurt. It could be an egg. Sure. You know, it could be soy milk if you don't eat animal foods. But you, know, you need to get that protein throughout the day so that we can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And then in terms and, of, you know, I was going to say, in the exercise, you need to be doing muscle strength in the exercise at least twice a week. Right. That's exactly what I was going to mention. Like some yeah. type of, like some type of lightweight training yeah. or, I mean, yeah. it, and here's the thing, if you've been lifting weights your entire life, mm -hmm. you know, if you've been in the gym and that's part of your, part of your lifestyle, I don't think that that should necessarily change just because you turn 65, right? Absolutely. If anything, you should increase it because... To get the benefit for your muscles, you need what we call progressive resistance exercise. Right. And that means you, you know, you want to lift that weight or, or use the TheraBand or your own body weight for planks or push-ups or whatever um, till you, your muscles say, no more. <laughs> I can't do another right. one. And then yeah. that can really help you build new muscle. So it's important to keep that up. Uh, I, I'm 72. So I've been active my whole life, but the muscle strengthening part, you know, kind of would, would come and go. Um, and now I work out with a personal trainer one day a week. My husband and I do it together in buddy sessions and one good okay. solid hour of weight training, you know, every muscle group. And so that's really been beneficial for both of us, um, even though we were active. But targeting that weight training part um, is, is hard for a lot of people. So find help if you need it. <laughs> so one of the things that we discuss often um yeah, kind of in, in close circles is the, I don't, I don't want to call it like an epidemic, but uh, it seems that a lot of men are suffering from lower levels of testosterone. Uh, and so, you know, some of the things that, you know, medical professionals tell you is that testosterone naturally declines as you get older. Uh, and obviously testosterone is something that's necessary to, to build and maintain muscle mass. Um, is that, a, is that an issue? Like, do you talk to your to your uh, patients about that often or is that is that just kind of popular media that's put that thought in our head i can't say that i have a lot of expertise in hormonal <laughs> aspects like that i know that you know a lot of hormones decline naturally as we get get old 
Um, you know, and I know some men are, you know, trying to take these testosterone boosters, but I think that would be something be best left for a, a man and the, his physician to talk about. Because yeah. again, there's so many bogus things out there that you can take. And you know, the other thing I would get concerned about is if you're if you're really taking something that's an anabolic steroid, that can increase your risk for cancer. So you point. want to be careful about what you're doing. There's always some maybe unintended consequences when you do things like that. But I, I think just the anabolic stimulation of working out is going to really give you the benefits that you need. I don't think you need to take a testosterone boost on the side. So we always like to end the show with a call to action. What's the one piece of advice you'd encourage our listeners to remember about nutrition as they navigate life and their senior years? My piece of advice is it's never too late. It's never too late to start, whether it's eating healthy, whether it's exercising, it's never too late. So don't throw your hands up and say, ah, I'm 70, I've never done anything, it's too late. It is not too late. So start today. And don't wait till Monday or January 2nd. That's really what you think. Well, it's the weekend, I'll wait till Monday to start. No, start right now, start at your next meal and try to improve what you're doing. 